entering politics doesn't mean that you're leaving the world as we know of criminality. Trust me, it's just the beginning. So on that makeup, can you talk me through it? Because you really do disappear into that. Is that like a prosthetic headpiece? Is it a chin piece? Like how did it Yeah, it's together? a bunch of them. Yeah, but there's like I think there was eight or nine pieces. The bodysuit was one piece. Uh, the bodysuit was in two pieces: my slacks and then my torso and arms, shoulders, and that. So that was two pieces. And then the makeup was one big anchor piece that had a chin and two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. And then once the nose went on, I was gone. The nose went on about about two hours and 15 minutes into it and then began the process of spray painting like a body shop every day. It's just different colorations and discolorations. And if he was more bloodshot or Voz was tired that day or if the stress had gotten to him, they could change the coloring of beneath the eyes. And it, it all, it felt really alive from the start until the very end. I mean, until the very last makeup, which I think, I think we applied 84 or 86 makeups or something. Um, till the very last day, they were changing things, minute little details in the trailer every morning. But I loved it, man. I loved the three hours at the start of every day. It gave me a chance to go over the script and see what was coming up and think about what work we had to do that day. And we listened to all sorts of music. We had donuts and pizza and coffee in the mornings. And it was a blast, man. I love the makeup team on this, but it was extraordinarily like if they put the makeup on you brother you, you would start to you would feel a change you would yeah. look in the mirror and see that looking back at you it was very empowering and very liberating you know it was extremely strange when i saw him out of the makeup because i've only you know now we're doing press together so i'm seeing him more but at the time you know when we were shooting i never saw him out of makeup i maybe saw him three times before we began and then i would only see oz and so the first couple of times I saw him out of makeup, like after we wrapped, it was so jarring because I spent eight months with this person and I associate that voice and those eyes with someone else. And so when I see him, like, you know, obviously I, I know Colin, I know his work, I know, you know, like I'm aware, but it, it felt like he body swapped or like, it was like Freaky Friday or something. It was so strange to hear Oz's voice come out of him. Um, so that was wild. And, but acting with him was like, you know, in, incredible. He's an incredible actor. He's one of our best. The makeup is so brilliant. You don't, it doesn't seem like makeup at all. So it just felt like, you know, I, it just felt like I was there with us. This takes place a week after the film, um, although we don't see Batman in it. Uh, I know there was kind of discussions to include him at one stage. Did you guys kind of scope out where Bruce Wayne is during this timeline and what is happening with the Batman to kind of have it in your heads, at least if he doesn't appear? Well, you know, what I always talked about with Matt and what he would always reiterate is that Gotham's a big city and the Batman cannot be everywhere. He's just a man. That's what makes his character so appealing is he's not a superhero. He doesn't have spidey sense. You know, he doesn't know everything that's happening in the city. Um, so we were conscious of that, you know, but at the same time in the film, he discounts Oz. He doesn't think much of him, just like everybody else doesn't think much of Oz. Um, and so it made a lot of sense that he wouldn't be inclined to suddenly make his presence known in where we are in our show. Um, but certainly, you know, we'll, there'll be focus on that in the second film. This was a time of great um, turmoil in the city because it's literally the week after what happened. And so, um, you know, much of the city is in desperation. And so police can't get everywhere. There's crime everywhere. It's a very, very dangerous time. So, He's out there trying to grapple with the aftermath of everything that happened, which to some degree he blames himself for. You know, I mean, obviously he missed that. It wasn't that Riddler knew who he was. It was that Riddler was inspired by his desire for vengeance in a way. And so all of that is what he's grappling with. Um, and as we enter in the next movie, we'll be seeing Batman um, occupying kind of a different there's, you know, there's a lot of unrest and there's a lot of uh, clamoring because of the revelations from what we find out at the end of the movie. And uh, there's unrest in the streets to say, well, how could this be? And, uh, you know, everybody is sort of the idea that that this corruption extends as deep as it extends um, creates a lot of um, I would say that in the first movie, Batman views things very simplistically in a certain way. He sees things in black and white and what he can represent and how can he, he can affect that. And as we enter into the next movie, um, 
there's a lot more gray. There's a lot more sort of people at odds. There's a lot of division within the city. It's a lot like the way our world is now where stuff is, there's a lot of turmoil because people are are sort of in their camps and they're not communicating. And how does Batman fit into that? Where does, where do you fit? It's not as clear as like going, oh yeah, bad guy. I go after bad guys, it makes things very easy. And when things are in gray, um, it makes it very hard to be Batman. And so that's part of the challenge as we're entering it. So what you're seeing here is part of what is brewing that is, you know, going to build into the conflict uh, into the next the next film. I wanted to ask, we, we kind of get a, a little bit of a sense of the Penguin's backstory in this show. And obviously he has this famous limp. I wonder, is there much of a sense of the backstory behind that beyond the kind of injury he has in the film that we've seen? Yeah, no, definitely. It was important for me and just across the board in our show to dig deeper into who Oz is psychologically and to understand what his backstory is, where he comes from, who his family is. You know, what we established in the first episode is that he has a club foot. Um, and to me, what I found interesting about that is that in present times, often people get surgery and can fix a club foot. Um, but in my mind, his mother, who didn't have a lot of money, also decided that didn't that difference in him would make him stronger, that he didn't need to change an aspect of himself in that regard. And so we you know, see in the first episode what he's dealing with and why he limps. Throughout the show, we get a little bit of a vibe of a sort of Sopranos feel to it, kind of to the point that he's got that relationship with his mother, uh, some of the mannerisms and stuff. I wonder if that was part of the inspiration at all while you guys were working on the show. No, I mean, I, I'm like honored to get comparisons to this, a show like The Sopranos. It's such an incredible show and has been so timeless in so many ways and so inventive. Um, but, you know, for me, it was really trying to dig deeper into Oz's psychology and what drives him. And I wanted to get to know his family and I wanted to understand where he came from. And it made sense to create a character like Francis um, in my mind, and to make sure that his drive is not just that he wants power, but he wants respect. And he wants respect from the masses, but most important, he wants respect from his mother. He wants her affection. He wants her to be proud of him. And what I think sets it apart from a show like The Sopranos is their relationship is a little bit more Oedipal between Oz and Francis. It's stranger. Um, we know his brothers have died, but we don't really know why. But I think inherently what that does to a relationship is it singles out a mother and a son and makes them their primary like person to focus a lot of attention on in both regard. Um, and so, you know, Oz also deeply loves her and is really driven by his desire to please her. To be honest with you, ma'am, between the writing and the makeup that Mike Marino designed for the original film, for the Batman it was, I, I felt like so much of the work was done for me. It was just a, a case of inhabiting it, which took three or four hours at the start of every day to get all the pieces applied. And then it was off to the races, man. I just felt like I was in the sandbox playing, you know, throwing paint at the wall. The character as envisioned by Matt Reeves initially had um, elements of, of so many kind of reference points for Matt, but it was all, it was all kind of fundamentally from the ground on up, there was an emotional and psychological component to Oz's struggle in life, his feelings that he was crippled, you know, his feelings that he was on the outside of the experience that he felt he deserved to be living in, the desire that he had, the deep desire to feel his mother's love in a way that he never fully felt access to it. All those things, psychological components were what Matt kind of gifted me. And then Lauren added on to it for the eight hours of this TV. But I didn't have any, any consciously any reference points. I should say, you know, but any, anything I've ever seen, any gangster film I've ever seen, it was all, it's all in there. You know what I mean? You you draw, whether you're aware of it or not, you draw from everything you've ever seen or ever heard, you know? I thought it was really interesting that the character of Victor <clears throat> um, has a stammer. It's not something you see in TV shows very much. I wonder if you could sort of speak to that decision and and why you came, came to it. Yeah, it was, it was important for me to give him a stutter because I think it made sense to me why Oz would keep a kid like that alive in part. Part of it is that he sees this kid who reminds him of himself in a way, but also that, you know, Victor has uh, a disability and Oz does too. And then they never speak about it. And it's not the only attribute of Victor, certainly. It's something that connects the two of them. Um, and yet, you know, I think I really wanted to depict a, a someone with a stutter without it being that's their major characteristic and that we always just talk about the fact that this is what he has. I think so many people have stutters and they don't get, 
you know, that conversation. They don't get to see themselves on screen very often. Um, and so we worked with uh, a dialect coach and someone who also has a stutter themselves. And they worked with Renzi Feliz, our, our actor who plays Victor. And the two of them together just created a really organic, um, I think, expression of what it might feel like to have a stutter and what it what it is. Your performance is incredible. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. I wonder Thank if you, you could kind of talk me through your approach to it, because there's kind of a big difference between like pre-Arkham and post and the yeah, accent sure. is mega. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you know, so much of it was in the writing. You know, Lauren LaFranc, our showrunner, is, has such a singular and brilliant mind. And, you know, especially once I got that fourth episode in my hands and I got to really see, you know, why and how she's driven mad. I definitely had a lot to work with. And then it was like a really big collaboration between our wardrobe designer and their hair and makeup. And I worked um, a little bit with a movement coach as well to try and like figure out how she holds herself and how she's been affected by things and how those manifest. And so it was like um, just a real, uh, I don't know, it was like a real thrill. It was a real thrill to create and build this person. Your character is quite connected to the comics and exists in the comics. I wondered like yeah. how much research did you do about that before taking on the role? Did you want to kind of come to it cold and do your own thing? I sort of avoided it because early on um, in my initial Zoom with Matt and Lauren, they both were like, just so you know, we're, we're, this, we're taking it in a different direction. And I, so I decided to like not confuse myself and I didn't. I didn't reference the comics. Um, and I, I know now like how it overlaps and how it does differentiate or different, whatever, defer, oh, God, my brain. Yeah, you, you know you what I there. mean? Like I know how, <laughs> it, it, how it honors it and how it goes in a different direction. And so I'm glad that I just sort of stuck to this, this particular universe that was like in front of me. I've heard you've auditioned for quite a lot of superhero roles in the past. What was it that made this one so special, would you say? that they were interested <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that I got it <laughs> like th this also just felt right like I mean I'm, you know I, I'm I'm kidding it just this did feel like you know there were many times in this process where I was like oh this was this is like actually the greatest match like I, I love this character so um vehemently and I I get why I didn't get those other things. Like I, I, they weren't, they weren't meant for me and the people who got them did a beautiful job. And that was like meant for them. Like, I think it's also part of getting older too. You're like, well, it's mine or it's not like, it's, it's, it's like something bigger at work about which role you're meant to play or um, whatever. But yeah, I mean, I certainly was jazzed that they, that they were interested. <laughs> so I understand you're kind of starting work on the Batman part two early next year. Have you seen scripts? Have you got a sense I've seen of nothing. what comes next for us? Well, okay. I haven't. A, I haven't a clue. Only, only going off, going off this show. I would imagine that he has some kind of political ambitions. You know, certainly wants to wants to um, inhabit a kind of a rarer air than he had been given the opportunity to inhabit up till now. I don't think he leaves the world of criminality, which entering politics doesn't mean that you're leaving the world as we know of criminality. Um, so, yeah, I would imagine it, it it might go into that realm. Yeah. So we're doing a show that is the kind of show that you can do in streaming where you can go even darker than you can go in a PG-13 movie. But the intention within the movie was always to flirt with that anyway. So we're always pushing the edge and that will absolutely continue in the next movie. I mean, they're they're movies that do explore the darkness. And so the next movie um, is going to find Batman Bruce in quite a uh, difficult situation. and. Um, you know, I think you'll be exploring aspects of his character that you haven't seen yet, which is exciting. Um, so I don't want to, I can't, I don't want to give too much away, but you'll be seeing, the idea is always to continue him on that journey and to flesh him out and build him even further in the same way that the Batman was completely from Batman Bruce's point of view. This movie will be from Batman Bruce's point of view, and you will be seeing aspects of his character that you have not seen before, which I think is going to be exciting. So Barry Kogan has been cast as the Joker. We see a little bit of him in the first film. And I know you did some amazing work then in Banshees and Sharon. Would you like to get the chance to do some scenes with him in the next oh, film? Oh, yeah, I'd love possible? that. Yeah, I thought he was fantastic. There was two scenes, wasn't there? There was one that was in the film and then there was one that was released afterwards. Slightly extended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought Barry was fantastic in it. And again, Mike Marino's work designing that was extraordinary. It was so creepy. So creepy. Um, I would love to get to work with Barry on that. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how we might approach it? Because it's such a seminal character that's had so many takes on it and stuff. Barry, I no, I just know we give it a lot of consideration. 
give it a lot of consideration and a lot of work. Barry works his arse off. He's a fantastic actor and he and he gets the head down when he needs to, you know? I think Barry, he's a wonderful actor. I mean, he's got, he's very, very special. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about was this idea that his his worldview was sort of um, formed um, by his being disfigured from birth. That, that was kind of like a cruel joke that life was playing on him. So it was something that his whole philosophy of life um, and the laughing that he does at it in that kind of sort of um, uh, insidious, upsetting way comes from um, the joke that has been played on him in his existence. This is who he is. And so it's how he sees the world. And so that's our point of entry into him. So it's a, it's, it's dealing with the themes that are Joker themes, but to try and find a different way in a different point of entry. Um, and so I'd say that was one of the things that we talked a lot, a lot about when we were, when we were doing the scenes that we were doing. It's really interesting to see this sort of deep dive on one of the villains. Is there another one that you'd love to explore? Or I know there was kind of talk of an Arkham TV show, a Gotham TV show. Is there another sort of tangential? Yeah, story actually, we are talking to HBO. We're talking to HBO about um, the opportunity to find the way. What's so exciting is in long form, especially given that the movies are so um, focused on being Batman point of view, to have the real estate to really look into who these rogues gallery characters are, that is one of the things that we have been talking about and that we find really exciting. And that for me, you know, in doing a year two Batman and the Batman, the idea was that we'd skip over his origins because we'd seen that done brilliantly before. And I thought, well, I, I don't really have a way of doing that again that I felt warrants being told. But I did think that that meant that in a way, because his presence is still new in the comics. The rogues gallery kind of make themselves in response to the arrival of this masked vigilante. So while it isn't his origin tale, it refers to his origin, it is their origin tale. And so you're seeing an Oz who's not yet the Kingpin. You're seeing Selena who's not yet Catwoman. You're seeing all of these characters. So the opportunity to look at how these characters come into being and what that's about psychologically, that to me is something that is super exciting to be able to explore with HBO. I mean, I just think there's so much ripe storytelling in Gotham City. There's a reason why there's been so many iterations prior that have taken place in Gotham. There's so many fantastic comics and different storylines um, that different writers have found. So it's fun to put your own personal stamp on, on a story, on a character and a place. Um, I don't have any that come to mind immediately, but to me, it's about... You know, when I thought about Oz, it was about me figuring out, do I have an emotional connection to a man like this? Like, can I tell this story? Should I be the one who tells this story? And that's really where I start as a writer. So for me, it would be about, is there another character who I feel that way with? Are there other stories that I feel like there's something I want to say in them? Um, and so we'll see. We'll see.